We'll go ahead and start with refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chudam sogi chunam lai jan chudu dani kapsuti dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupan show sange chudam sogi chunam la jan chupadu dani kapsuti dagi chun yangi pe sonam ki Rola penche sange rupa show sange churum sogi chunam la jancho padu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange rupa show and letting the motivation sink in. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. We're doing Tara. We're starting chapter four. And this Tara chapter is really beautifully and elegantly laid out. Um, there's really nice, short, pithy explanations of all the main things that you'd probably initially be curious about, like what are the 21 Taras, like what are the eight fears, what's the story with Tara, um, all of that just really beautifully laid out, so I really recommend to read the chapter. We'll be doing Tara for a couple of sessions in a row. We'll do uh, green Tara, we'll do 21 Taras, we'll do white Tara, and um, it's going to be a Tara extravaganza. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Um, I thought there was a very pithy section right at the very end of the chapter about who Tara is or what Tara is kind of more cosmically. So I'm just going to read you straight from the text that little section, because I think it really helps encapsulate the whole concept. Okay. So it says the mother of all the victorious ones. So Tara is also called mother of the victorious ones because just as a mother gives birth to her children, Tara gives birth to all the Buddhas. The ultimate meaning of Tara is the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and emptiness, the culmination of both the method side of the path and the wisdom side fused in one mind. This is synonymous with the clear light, the dharmakaya or truth body of the Buddha. This transcendental wisdom is called non-dual bliss and emptiness because it is characterized by three things. It is realized emptiness, it experiences great bliss, and it has the feeling of vastness or being empty. This is the omniscient mind that sees both the absolute and conventional truth of all existence simultaneously. This dharmakaya is the absolute guru, the real meaning of guru. It is important that we understand the word guru means much more than a human being who teaches us. Even though the Buddhas have different aspects and different names, they are all born from the dharmakaya. In reality, every Buddha is the embodiment of this absolute guru. One manifests in many forms, many manifest in one form. When this manifests in an ordinary aspect as the conventional guru, this is the absolute guru appearing as the, the Lama we directly receive teachings from. As Kedrup Sangayeshe explained, before the guru, there is not even the name Buddha. First, we meet the guru externally and separately. After receiving teachings, we listen, reflect, and meditate on the path that is revealed by this guru. On the basis of correct devotion to the guru, we gradually actualize the complete path and remove our obscurations. When that happens, we meet the guru mentally. By gradually actualizing the path and achieving the dharmakaya, we achieve the absolute guru. So all the Buddhas are born from the absolute guru, the dharmakaya, the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and emptiness which is the actual meaning of mother. This transcendental wisdom, this completely pure subtle mind manifests in this single, in this female aspect that is labeled Tara. 
Okay. So, so I think that there's something really important by thinking about the relationship between the concept of wisdom and the feminine aspect of Buddhas. So whenever you're seeing like mother or female aspect or wisdom references, I think that it's interesting to explore what's being pointed at. And it's also interesting to explore that Mother Tara is called Mother Tara, but in other commentaries, she's Venerable Arya Tara, Venerable indicating that she's actually a nun. She's a monastic, despite her hair and her fancy clothes. She is a renunciate with celibacy. And one of her feet is out, ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings, but the other foot is drawn in, showing her complete control, renunciation, and subjugation over all negative states of mind, like desire and attachment. So how is she mother and a renunciate? This is very confusing. We're talking about this kind of metaphoric female energy, the womb-like space of potentiality. Yeah, so in Tantra... There's a lot of references to feminine and wisdom being related. And the reason for that is the feminine reproductive system is a space of potentiality. And it's a space where nothing necessarily has been born, but it could. It's a place where things could be born from. And so this is analogous to the space-like emptiness, which is filled with potentiality. Does that make sense? It's kind of the way these get layered together. And so all the Buddhas are born from Tara or born from Prajnaparamita or born from wisdom itself, meaning there would be no Buddhas unless things were empty of inherent existence and realized as such. And that the absolute guru, the ultimate Tara that we're talking about, this non-dual wisdom of bliss and emptiness is a concept that keeps getting repeated in Tantra, and it can be kind of far out. But when we're talking about the transcendental wisdom of bliss and emptiness, this is the Tantra way of explaining method and wisdom. In the sutra tradition, we say method, compassion, loving kindness, patience, all the really tangible, practical, deep, but intellectually easy enough sort of side of the path related to our response to relative truth. And wisdom is the wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah, method, wisdom, simple ish, right? Then in Tantra, same wisdom, same wisdom realizing emptiness, but the method side is all of those positive characteristics like loving kindness, compassion, etc. But in this context, we start talking about the method being bliss. And that's where it starts getting a little bit confusing and a little bit like difficult to speak about in a public setting like this, where there's a mixture of people with and without empowerments. But if you're thinking just in general, the kind of blissful, happy mind that happens in any number of contexts, whether it's like a nice meditative bliss or it's other kinds of bliss in your life, that that pleasant feeling mentally and physically gets conjoined with a, a realization of emptiness and the two become inseparable. The two become inseparable. So when you experience any kind of pleasantness, you remember emptiness. When you remember emptiness, it comes together with a feeling of bliss. And this is an interesting way to start to live even before you have any empowerments is how can you experience all of the good things in your life richly, deeply in an engaged and present way and remember that they're empty. Because what can happen is that as soon as you remember something is empty, it kills the joy, right? right? Like say you're just having a really amazing conversation with someone and you think, oh, we're really connecting, we're really bonding, we're really like, you know, getting to be stronger as friends. Oh, this food is delicious. Oh, this is a wonderful circumstance. I'm so happy. Ah, I remember emptiness, remember emptiness. And they're like, oh, not from its own side. Oh, that means not really there. Oh, that means... <sighs> right, which is a complete misunderstanding, complete misunderstanding, but it can happen, right? As soon as you remember that things are empty, it sometimes takes the fun out of it because things are only fun if they are as they appear to be, or they are permanent as they appear to be, or they are something, right? This is an easy tangle to get into. And so even before you have empowerments to start playing with, how can I 
not let the remembrance of emptiness kill my joy? How can I let the remembrance of emptiness actually elevate my joy and de-escalate attachment at the same time? So how about I lean in more fully to all that is pleasant mentally and physically, but unhook myself from the trap of attachment by remembering emptiness? Yeah, so you're remembering emptiness in the sense of, all right, so this is pleasant and wonderful through some causes and conditions that I could articulate and guess at, and a whole bunch that I couldn't. It all came together. No one part of this is the happiness from its own side. Yeah, it's not the cake I'm eating. It's not the conversation I'm having. It's not the person in front of me. It's not the weather today. It's not any one thing making this a happy moment. It's a completely dependent arising of countless causes and conditions coming together. And even my ability to label it as happiness or pleasure is dependently arisen. How wonderful, <laughs> right? Not, oh, that means it doesn't count. Don't go there. That's actually tiptoeing towards either eternalism or nihilism, depending on your vibe. But does it, it kind of can happen, can't it? When you're trying to either work on renunciation or work on the wisdom realizing emptiness in your everyday life, bringing in those realizations unhooks your attachment, but sometimes also unhooks the pleasure. And what we want to do is kill the attachment, keep the pleasure. And that very fact reinforce your understanding of emptiness. Questions? Thoughts? Um, I just, uh, I was just thinking um, when um, something happened to you as you, you want to uh, point the emptiness of inherent existence, it's sometimes it's more um, um, easy to when you are sad. Like mm. I was in in the in the train and I I saw the, um, a man beside me. He was suffering because of a wound he had, and I just I was thinking and I. I don't know. I said, "Oh, it's like me. I had something like on my arms, and my, I was like tears coming out." And I, then it was like I was released. I said, "Those are empty. Like, don't um, uh, grasp to it. Don't say that it's me. It's you. Uh, we are all suffering." And and uh, somehow it was like I was. Then I was not happy, but released. But yeah. I think it's more difficult for me, like as a practitioner, like I began to, to see what is all about. I think yeah. when I'm happy, I want to take it. Yeah. It's more easy when, when you're sad to say, oh, it's good that you feel the sadness because you had it. And then you say, oh, all oh, it's empty. And it's like, you're really... <laughs> Well, because with happiness, you want th to know how to replicate it, right? With happiness, you want to say, okay, what just happened? Because that was great. What just happened? So it must have been, it must have been that the cafe was that really good temperature. And it must have been that it was that time of day where it wasn't too busy. And it must have been this, 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 and this. So if I have those things together, it's going to work next time exactly the same way. Because those are what made it good. And we never know the whole story of what made it good. Yeah, we grasp onto a few key elements that, you know, are surefire ways to get a bit of pleasure because they have often enough. Yeah, and we have that kind of intermittent reinforcement like Pavlov's dog where it works often enough that we assume it always will. Yeah. And so remembering emptiness frees you up to have more pleasure more often because you think any number of ingredients could be labeled as this is happiness. I can relabel and relabel and relabel any number of things and also bring in mind training to do that as well. And as long as I keep my feet on the ground and I don't kind of get flaky with it, this is really enriching practice. Yeah, there's, of course, a way to get flaky with it, where you start labeling things that are just so dissonant, you know, you say, no, this is good, this is good. And it's like, it's not good. It really isn't good on the relative sphere. But you're like talking over the top of your common sense. 
we don't want to do that. But if you're thinking like, all right, say, you know, the example I always give about moving house is frustrating and annoying, but if you're lifting the same amount of weights on purpose to make yourself strong, that same experience gets relabeled as this discomfort is making me stronger. And then gradually this discomfort makes me happy. And then gradually, I don't even call it discomfort. It's just a physical sensation that I'm used to now. Yeah. So remembering emptiness is remembering possibility-ness. Yeah, like potentiality-ness. This kind of thing. Yeah, where it's not exactly as it seems, but I'm acknowledging how it seems. That there are countless causes and conditions, and yes, some of them I can replicate and be, you know, fairly certain I'm going to get a similar result, but it's not going to be all the same factors, and I don't have control over all the factors. So with pleasure, it is definitely harder because we really want to think, I found the secret ingredient to be happy. It's all those things that just happened when the moment was great. And then we do all those same exact things again, and somehow it doesn't work. This can prove emptiness to us, but what it usually does is just makes us sad and blame some one condition and say, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain, you cup of tea. <laughs> you were supposed to augment this moment and you failed. Right. Yeah. So Tantra is an interesting thought experiment, but even before you're fully in, you can start kind of wondering about that kind of psychology of holding on to the parts that are useful and letting go of the parts that aren't. And in um, the chat, there was a question that says, can you give more detail on how to keep the pleasure? And the thing is, is you can't really keep it longer than the karma has potentiality to throw. It's just that sometimes we kill the potentiality of that joyful moment by sprinkling in different things that kind of suffocate its growth process. So really imagine karmic seeds as being like seeds. It has the potential for a certain lifespan and whatever causes created that karmic seeds potentiality you can't add to its potentiality. You can only burn it, yeah, or exhaust it through experiencing it, both good seeds and bad seeds. Now, that said, if you're having a positive seed ripen for happiness and its potent potency is finishing and ending, you can ripe another one right on its tail and you can have back-to-back -back good seeds and move from happiness to happiness to happiness to full enlightenment. But the main thing that water is positive seeds are positive states of mind, which means you have to be mindful enough to maintain positive states of mind to continuously water positive seeds. Yeah. And we all know you can stay mindful for however long, but then you're going to get distracted and still be kind of riding the wave of a previous seed, feeling generally content, but also distracted. And the longer you're distracted, the more old habits have the chance to rear up and water seeds for suffering. Yeah. Questions, thoughts? Yes, I, I just really wanted to thank you for pulling all of those ideas together in the way that you just did, because I've never heard them brought together in that way. And so to bring in the attachment, the joy and the together and the emptiness, all of that, um, that you just said, which I cannot repeat, but um, I have never heard it pulled together like that. And I've always been torn between um, feeling happy and that the, the, the ideas that I have about emptiness, which I'm sure are completely like really not <laughs> very understanding. Um, but I do find that when I think about emptiness, my thoughts about emptiness, it does deflate the mm. feeling, whatever it is. And in some cases, that's a very good thing because then I can be more objective about what's happening. Yeah. And so I've used it in that way, but I've never understood how to use it in the context of, oh, be happy. Because His Holiness always says we want to be happy. But then in my personal upbringing, mm. that was not supposed to be something I was to be focused on. <laughs> So I was very confused, and this makes perfect sense to me, what you're saying. So thank you so, so much. 
Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. And I mean, the, the same can be said for renunciation, right? It's remembering renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara, you're wanting to give up attachment to samsaric pleasures, which doesn't mean giving up pleasures. It means giving up attachment, underline the word attachment. That's the problem, right? The pleasure is not the problem. It's just that we associate the pleasure with what it's actually not associated with. And then we chase something that was never the thing giving it and cause trouble and hurt ourselves and others, et cetera, right? So renunciation is really freeing up yourself for more happiness as well. Both renunciation and the wisdom realizing emptiness mean more happiness, not less, the more you remember them. And then when you get to bodhicitta, you're thinking I'm exchanging cherishing self for cherishing others that's also going to ruin my fun. <laughs> and in fact, no, that's the very thing that plants more and more and more positive karmic seeds for more and more and more happiness all along the way, as well as all of the momentum you need for realizations. But at first, when you think to yourself, oh, cherish others, cherish others, cherish others, you immediately think that means nothing for me. <laughs> and that's not at all what's meant. It's like you start to prioritize your real causes for happiness instead of your sort of samsara symptoms relief conditions for happiness. So you're actually giving yourself more opportunities for joy for the sake of others, knowing that when you're in a joyful, peaceful, centered place, you're of greatest benefit to people in a very direct way. And you also model for them the possibility of happiness in ordinary moments. Yeah, and you don't put the pressure of your own sadness on people when you're coming to them with all your baggage. So bodhicitta also bringing happiness is sometimes counterintuitive because you think, well, I want happiness for others. I shouldn't be having happiness first. But it's kind of like you have to be so filled that you're overflowing and leaking out. Yeah, like a wellspring. Not like you first, me second. It's it's the you first kind of holds you in the right positioning for all of your stuff to ripen. So it's not like instead of me, sentient beings. It's sentient beings before me. And just by thinking sentient beings before me widens your focus, which puts all of your problems of this moment into the correct perspective and they immediately become more manageable. Yeah. It's it's an interesting thing to look at with bodhicitta because as soon as you are having like a bad day with a couple things going wrong that are genuinely going wrong in the relative world, you know, you've got a headache, right? Or you've, you're like having a digestive issue or your boss is being mean or whatever is happening, it's happening. And as soon as you think of others, how they're suffering and what they need, your own problems shrink to the correct proportion. And you think, yeah, those things are still happening, but actually they're not worrying me as much because I have bigger fish to fry. Yeah, I've got more on my plate than just my own stuff. I'll come back to my own stuff in a moment, but let's just kind of expand the vision outwards because self-cherishing is what narrows it in and kind of suffocates all of your creativity and makes you kind of insular and kind of just small in your mind and kind of foggy. Yeah, as soon as you can open the mind back up again, then there's a lot more flow and flexibility. So that's the first benefit just right away. And then of course, by doing that, that creates a powerful condition to water your old good seeds, which then will slowly or not so slowly ripen into present moment happiness. So the thing we don't realize about karma is the lag time. Yeah, that's the thing that we get hung up on with karma is that it's the mental factor of intention that plants karma on the mental continuum, but it's the mental factor of feeling where it's experienced. And so you might think I'm thinking positive, good, kind things, but I'm not happy. I'm doing my practice, but I'm not happy. And what you want to do is to not worry about happiness being immediate, know that happiness will come. So by doing your practice, doing it genuinely without being too worried about whether you're immediately happy or not, really doing it for the sake of others, plant seeds for the future, and waters seeds from the past. 
simultaneously. Yeah, by practicing, you're planting seeds for the future, watering seeds of the past. And then you give it a minute and then some of those past seeds start sparking up and you start getting quite happy. And then happiness begets happiness and you get on a roll and your practice becomes really joyful and blissful. And you're watering old seeds and planting new seeds and watering old seeds and planting new seeds. And all of it is in the realm of virtue and happiness. And you really can get on a beautiful roll with it. But to allow yourself the acknowledgement of the lag time. Yeah, and I think we all know that feeling of days when you don't particularly feel like practicing and you sit down and it is a struggle for about a minute and a half. It's like a war to sit still. You're like, I don't want to, <laughs> right? I don't want to. And if you just let that resistance roll through and say, but I'm going to anyway, just friendly and gently, but I'm going to anyway, it won't get better for a minute and a half. It'll, it'll be awful and then it'll be better, <laughs> right? Give it a minute. Yeah, so that's the thing with karma is you've got to give it a minute to kick in. Yeah, what's happening in the present is really not about the present. What's happening in the present is creating a future and engaging with a past. Yeah. Um, thank you, Maribel. I actually had a question from uh, a couple of weeks ago when you uh, made this comment and you said, you know, that Lojong is um, like thought transformation for the conceptual mind. Um, and Tantra is like, I thought what you said is Lojong for the subtle mind, mm -hmm. but I didn't follow this, that part, Tantra being Lojong. Yeah, and um, I said the concept the, I said the coarse mind, not necessarily the conceptual mind, because the coarse mind, I don't know, broader, anyway, fine point. But um, the subtle mind is not yet accessible, but it's still trainable. Yeah. So that's a weird thing to sit, sit with. The subtle mind is not yet accessible, but it is still trainable. What does that mean? What it means is that all of the conditions around it are things that we can start to have influence over so that they will kick in when we have the merit or the conditions for the subtle mind to manifest. So if our practice never develops to the point where we can experience the subtle mind in meditation, we will experience it at death. And if we've been really conditioning the mind with Tantra and really conditioning the mind, particularly bodhicitta, renunciation, emptiness, then at the time of death, those thoughts condition the mind such that when the, the fundamental mind becomes manifest, it's kind of carrying that habituation and there's more potential for progress. Yeah, I thought that was so fascinating what you just said. I never thought about, you know, I just... I'm like what you said, like the subtle mind is inaccessible. And I feel like I'm going through the motions and doing my Vajrayana practice. But now I think I, you know, at least feel like the benefit is that even though I have no access, but it's conditioning, like it's just, you know, doing all those visualizations or whatever, something may happen. Totally. And I mean, and in the middle, right? So you've got the coarse mind, the subtle mind, and the extremely subtle mind. That subtle mind, we are aware of during our dreams, but sometimes it just, it's not lucid. It just passes us by and we think I had a weird dream. But every once in a while, we do have a lucid dream. And if when you're having a lucid dream, you can start to choose practice, that is a very good sign. And that's something we might even be able to start playing with as we are at our level right now. And so starting to work with the, the subtle mind, not the extremely subtle mind, which will only be accessible at the time of death, that one is very interesting because that'll be akin to the Bardo state. And if we cannot believe our own projections while we dream, we're less likely to believe our own projections in the Bardo. And if more than that, we're able to transform our projections into kind of wholesome projections related to Tantra or Sutra or anything Dharma related, that will hold us in amazing stead. So if you wanted to start working on some dream yoga, that's always a fun kind of side project. Yeah, I'm just so excited that the subtle mind can be conditioned, you know, right? like even, <laughs> even, even not knowing what I'm doing, something good is happening. <laughs> It's like, it's like kind of making everything conducive for it to be workable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Christine. 
Oh, hi, Venerable Youngton. So um, someone once said that um, when we, when the clear, clear light mind of death appears, you know, after all of the dissolutions and all of that, and, um, but that mind has to be trained. That mind isn't. So is that what you're talking about here? And, and that's the very subtle mind I'm assuming, I'm assuming that you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so it is, you know, I mean, at this point, I'm just hoping for a then best rebirth possible. Yeah. So how is it? What can I do in this life to hopefully have the best rebirth possible in the next life? To I must have to be, I must have to do something to that extremely subtle mind to make it so that it that is what gets produced in the Bordeaux. Is so what is it? Is it all the practices that I'm doing that's already working on it conditions the very subtle mind as well? Yeah, yeah. And okay. you know, so I guess just sort of a side note in case anyone got lost. So when I'm saying the subtle mind, generally I mean the extremely subtle mind, the clear light mind, synonymously. Oh, yeah. okay. There, okay. So there are three levels, right? There's the coarse mind, the subtle mind, the extremely subtle mind. Usually when I say subtle mind, I'm meaning that last one because we don't really talk about the middle one very often. So in, in the context of Snay's question, I was talking about the extremely subtle mind. And in your question, I'm talking about the extremely subtle mind. Okay. That's which is also to... called the clear light mind. The clear light mind, right. Okay. Yeah. And that extremely subtle consciousness or the fundamental consciousness that arises naturally at the time of death, we don't have to manufacture it, but the, what we're trying to do is then recognize it. So just like with the two kinds of dharmakaya, there's the fact that the mind is empty of inherent existence. That's natural. We don't have to do anything about that. That just is, that's our natural Buddha nature. But then there's the part of the mind that has to recognize that. Yeah. So it's not enough to just have the mind be empty of inherent existence. You have to recognize that. You have to realize that directly. And so the way in which you do that is just in your life, you're trying to study emptiness. You're trying to condition your mind to be very, very habituated to bodhicitta. And then when the clear light mind manifests, hopefully there is also the recognition. And another way to reinforce the recognition is to do things like the eight stages at the time of death meditation with the visualizations. And when you do those visualizations, you know, they live in the realm of imagination and part of you doubts, is that really what's going to happen? But a lot of meditators, a lot of ordinary people, a lot of people who have had strokes or near death experiences say, yeah, no, that's what happens. And maybe even we've caught a couple stages in certain moments in our life, like sometimes you'll catch the mirage vision, sometimes you'll catch even billowing smoke. Regardless, if you kind of manufacture those in the realm of imagination, even if it's not precise, if that's familiar enough, then at the time of death, there's part of the you that'll say, oh, that's it. It's empty of inherent existence. Yeah. And what is the mind that realizes the uh, emptiness? Is that the clear light mind or what what mind can realize depends that? On what level yeah it depends on what level so right now it has to start as a thought the, right? the point of this is that i think that we get too magical about how we think about perception the way to perception is through conception yeah the way to realize something directly perceptually in an unfabricated unconditioned way is to think about it a lot <laughs> <laughs> right? The conceptual thinking mind must be engaged a great deal for it to yeah. kick into a realization. I see yeah. what you're saying. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So it's just repetition and merit. Yeah. Repetition make it and merit. You make it. it is, but it's also, you don't fake the intellectual understanding. That's just raw intelligence, merit, study, repetition. I mean, the visualization, so. Yeah, the visualization, you fake it. But with the visualization, you can read the text description and visualize quite, you know, yeah. similar to what it will be. And then you bring in your intellectual understanding of emptiness to it. Yeah. But the thing is, in Tantra, it's a lot more fun because what you're doing is you're visualizing, say, Tara, and then remembering she's empty of inherent existence. You don't have to think, what does my mind look like in the clear light state? What does my mind look like in a fundamental state? You just think Tara appears and she is empty and it is blissful. 
yeah or medicine buddha or manjushri or whoever right pick your fave yeah appears while empty so the appears is less important than the recognition that it is empty yeah and in all of the tantric sadhanas that's repeated concept again and again things arise out of emptiness as this they dissolve back into emptiness they arise they dissolve right so don't get too fixed on the appearance get really used to the remembrance it's empty that's more important and all of it is very important that you think why am i doing this <laughs> right the only reason for tantra is bodhicitta yeah otherwise you can just stick to the sutra path but because of the urgency of the need of sentient beings you need to practice tantra now of course some schools of thought will say it's also for your own sake it's not just a bodhicitta reason that you actually can't achieve the fully enlightened state without tantra there are some schools of thought that believe that. And I think it's an interesting thing to play with possible. But regardless, we're already Mahayana practitioners. And so we already want to do our path for the sake of all sentient beings. So all sentient beings could use us to get our act together. The quickest way is Tantra. So having that aspiration then makes you turn back to the beginning and make sure that that foundation is solid. Yeah, that highest aspiration should make the beginning even more important than it used to be. If it was just for you, you could be like, yeah, renunciation is a good idea. I'll look at it sometimes. But anyway, I like bodhicitta. That seems really warm and friendly. I like that. Or I like wisdom. That's really interesting intellectual discussion. Yeah, I like that. But anyway, everything in its own time. <laughs> but if it's for others, you really need to have your act together, right? It's got to be solid foundation. You don't want to mess around. Yeah. Questions or thoughts? More Tara? Ready for Tara? Oh, Laran, go ahead. Yes. Uh, um, when we we are doing imagination, for example, for Tara or uh, Manjushri or others, we we uh, I heard that you, everybody says that you you have to you need to imagine it like uh, from light. Uh, it's uh, transparent and light. Is it helping us to say that it's empty of inherent existence, or is it for us to know that they are not like? that flesh uh, like us is it a um, um like empty of inherent existence and light and uh, don't yeah don't, it, don't mix those two too much everything is empty ladan everything yeah so it's not like because it's made of light it's empty but the things made of flesh are not empty we are also empty even though we're big you know bags of bones right so yes. you're remembering emptiness so you don't get hooked on it, thinking it's coming from its own side, right? So what what is our body built of? It's built of the sperm and egg from our parents and all the things we've eaten and all the things and all the things. What's the body of the Buddha created out of? It's created out of merit and wisdom, right? It comes about through the development of those. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking it comes out of emptiness, it prevents you from thinking just magically out of nowhere, unrelated to cause and effect, here's Tara, right? Ta-da, right? You don't want to think that because it makes you a fundamentalist. And it also mm -hmm. makes you think that her state is something other than the state that you will develop or that you're working on, right? You have to remember that Tara came about through causes and conditions, yeah, so she, her development is empty of inherent existence, just like our and our development mm -hmm. is empty of inherent existence. Mm -hmm. So you're remembering again and again, so you don't get fixed on kind of a funny idea about the Buddhas themselves, that they're like somehow the special case that is la is somehow magically inherent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Tara, yay, Tara, ooh, here we go. Um, so chapter four, and um, this is from a different book called Skillful Grace, which has some really interesting bits and pieces about Tara. Um, in it, it quotes some of the sutras, which I thought you might find interesting. So in we read in the Vimalakirti near Sadesa Sutra that Tara says, in this life, 
there is no such distinction as male and female, self-identity, a person, or any perception of such. Therefore, attachment to the idea of male and female is quite worthless. Weak-minded worldlings are continually deluded by this. However, the sutra goes on to record the following vow by Tara. There are many who wish to gain enlightenment in a man's form, but there are very few who wish to work for the welfare of sentient beings in a female form. Therefore, may I, in a female body, work for the welfare of beings until samsara has been emptied. So it looks like a contradiction or it looks like some sort of paradox. If there's, you know, in emptiness, there is no distinction of male and female. Male and female are merely labeled by the mind on any number of collections of any number of parts. So kind of clinging to male, clinging to female is another symptom of grasping at inherent existence. From beginningless time until now, this consciousness has entered into so many different kinds of samsaric bodies, human bodies, animal bodies, bodies of light, all sorts of bodies, bodies that were so-called female, so-called male, everything in between. We've been everything all the time. And now here we are in a bag of bones that has been labeled as some sort of gender that we either are fine with or aren't fine with, but there it is. Clinging to it would be a problem. However, <laughs> however, there is a problem in the relative world, isn't there? In, in the relative world, pe female bodied people are looked down on. And in the relative world, all cultures across the board, with very few exceptions, women are seen as needing to be subordinate or whatever. And of course, that's changing in lots of ways. But I think Tara's vow is interesting because she's saying, despite the fact that there is no inherently existent gender, since I wound up with a female looking body or a female seeming body or a, a female projected body or however you want to frame it, I'm going to just keep going with that trend and stay a lady, right? <laughs> despite the fact that women have you know, fewer resources and access to Dharma and women have bodies that are more complicated and problematic from a certain perspective, but also more magical and wonderful from another perspective, whatever. She's kind of saying, putting aside the fact that gender lacks inherent existence, in the relative world, gender is very important to people. And so far, people in leadership are by and large, percentage wise, men. So, in this lady body, I'm going to attain enlightenment and vowed to do so and did. So it's an interesting kind of like thing to sit with, with your own relationship to your own gender of internally, let's work on it not being such a core identity feature. Externally, if we're in a woman's body, how can we model a better way to use a woman's body and not feel so oppressed by the patriarchy, right? <laughs> But internally, you're kind of trying to get rid of all of that over-identification, yet externally using it as a tool. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, and, you know, and of course, when we're at Dharma centers, most of the time, Dharma centers are mostly women. It's weird, yeah? And then all the people in leadership are mostly men. It's weird, isn't it? Um, so obviously still a problem, um, despite the fact that that vow was made many moons ago. So um, I say let's keep being ladies if we can. We're not ladies, just women. How's that? We don't have to be ladies, just be women. <laughs> Christine? We hold up half the sky. I, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I just want to note, I think every woman, I think every person on this call is a woman. I think today, yes. Yeah, not always, but today, yeah. Not Woo! always. Yeah. <laughs> Team Tara. <laughs> Now, of course, for men, it is very good for them to practice Tara because it helps them with their toxic masculinity. It also helps them with their over-identification in the male form, right? It can help so many things. And, you know, for us kind of jumping in and out of forms in Tantra that are, you know, some young forms, some old forms, some beautiful forms, some wrathful forms, some male forms, some female forms, all of that helps break down your grasping at the self. Yeah. So it's like whatever tool you're using in Tantra, use it as written. Don't think I can't do, I can't be a man's body when I'm doing Manjushri, even though it's a male deity, I'll have to make Manjushri female. 
don't do that. Yeah. When you're doing Manjushri, you're male. When you're doing Tara, you're female. Neither of them are male or female, right? They're just adopting an aspect for a particular purpose. Is anybody lost? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this iconography conversation is from Andy Weber. There's also a really good iconography conversation in the book itself, but I thought to share this one. So Tara is a special deity of the manifestation of all the Buddha's holy ac actions. Yes, holy actions of body, speech, and mind. Therefore, she is called mother. By depending on Tara, one receives enlightenment as all those who in the past have depended on this special deity. This manifestation of all the Buddha's holy actions have received enlightenment. So like Manjushri is a Buddha of wisdom and Chenrezig is a Buddha of compassion, Tara is a Buddha of action and protection, which is not to say she doesn't also have compassion and wisdom, and it's not to say they don't always also have action and protection, right? But the emphasis, so the emphasis of Tara is action. And so when you see the iconography, um, often a question comes about like, why the jewelry? Why the, you know, billowing clouds of fabrics? Why all of this like accoutrement? You know, aren't we supposed to be renunciation focused? And of course, it's all symbolic. Um, in this case, the jewels represent the six perfections. And the necklace, for example, is the three types of generosity. So, and the anklets and armlets are discipline. So each of the things that she's wearing is representing one of the six perfections. And the green color represents the wind element and indicates the speed through which Tara responds, that leg out ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. And the right hand shows the gesture or the mudra of fearlessness and granting refuge. The left hand shows the gesture or mudra of bestowing blessings and guidance. And she has um, Dharma wheels in her hands in this depiction, but not always. Holding the stem of an Utpali flower between the thumb and ring finger. And an Utpali flower is just a blue lotus. It shows knowledge of the three times. And the three fingers up represent the three jewels of refuge. And this also indicates her supreme enlightenment and union of method and wisdom. So Tara's mantra is one of the ones that is said to be very useful in protecting when things are really difficult in real time. Like if you're having a serious traffic situation and it's really scary, or you're in a really unsafe situation, like it's an earthquake or there's a thief or whatever, Tara is said to be very, very useful, particularly in those contexts and for overcoming the eight fears. So let's see. First, we'll just look at it. So here's the Tara mantra garland, which should be visualized three-dimensionally, standing upright. And it's Om Tare, Tu Tare, Ture Soha. And sometimes you'll see it depicted within the mandala, like in this picture. And this kind of helps you look at it standing upright. Yeah, like that. But um, when you're looking at Tara's mantra, don't see it as moving like this, but imagine that you can see all of the syllables simultaneously. Yeah, so you're not visualizing it moving it like this is moving, but imagine you're able to see every single syllable. So for those with the empowerment, you visualize them facing inward, arranged counterclockwise in the manner of reading them, and the light is moving in and out. Okay. So the short praise that you'll see in the Chittamani Tara Puja kind of gives a good summary of what the mantra means. So this short praise is, you know, Om, I prostrate to the goddess foe destroyer, liberating Lady Tara. And that's basically what Om means, although always means enlightened body, speech, and mind. Homage to Tara, saviorous heroine, with Tutare, dispelling all fears, granting all benefits with Ture, to her with sound so ha, I bow. So that's kind of a good summary meaning of the mantra right there embedded in that praise. And that praise is a really nice praise to do um, as part of your practice if you like it. 
So Om, as always, is Tara's holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. And then the Tare Tutare Ture contains the essence of the Four Noble Truths. So the essence of the Four Noble Truths, basically suffering and its causes are eliminated. Then the second two Noble Truths, cessation and paths, all the suffering is completely overcome and liberation is achieved. So that Tare is the release from samsara, basically meaning the female one who releases, and it shows Tara's function. So sometimes you hear like Tara, the liberator, right? Um, so releases from suffering. She gives us release from samsara. And then the two Tare is this release from the eight fears. And it corresponds specifically to the second noble truth in that it frees us from the true cause of suffering, karma and delusions. So freeing from the eight fears, these are the eight fears with some modern art. Um, the eight fears or eight dangers, they're related to external things like from elements such as fire and water and thieves and dangerous animals. But the main dangers are not external, but internal, coming from our delusions, such as ignorance and attachment. So relying on Tara liberates us from these eight internal fears, these eight disturbing thoughts, and as a consequence, frees us from the external dangers that arise from these disturbing thoughts. To guide us from these eight different fears, there are eight different aspects of Tara in this context. Okay. So the first is like the fear or danger of fire, which really is the fear or danger of hatred. So if you have a lot of hatred, you're creating the cause to experience a lot of fire in your life, whether literally or metaphorically, it's not going to end well, and it burns up all of your virtue. So from the book, Rinpoche says, Tara, who saves us from the fear of the danger of fire and the fear of hatred, Hatred is the unsubdued mind that wishes to harm another being. Because it is such a violent, intense mind, it has the power to destroy all our virtue. It is compared to fire, which can destroy everything in its path. Living with anger is like having burning coal in the heart. Just a tiny spark can set off a grass fire that can destroy a city. A spark of hatred can lead to creating harm that brings retaliation and then counter-retaliation. In this way, it can destroy lives. Like a fire, hatred can rage through our life and kill our relationships and destroy any pleasures we might have. Anger can destroy everything, and therefore it's often referred to as the most destructive negative mind. By taking refuge in Tara, we can be protected from the danger of both hatred and the external fire element. It can be understood in both ways. Okay, so that premise that we're freeing from external fears and internal fears, and of course the internal one is the main thing, but why is it we have external things that are problematic in our life? It's because of our negative karma. And what kind of style they take or what kind of aspect they take is not accidental. Um, if you've ever done teachings on the 10 non-virtues and the results of the 10 non-virtues, the environmental effect is an interesting one to look at. Like, for example, if you have a lot of harsh speech karma, then you live in very uneven terrain that is hard to grow crops on and, you know, kind of easily um, loses vitality and stuff like that. So I was thinking about that other, <laughs> the other day walking around Pachapani and it's all very rocky and hilly and all very uneven. And I thought, okay, well, this is some ripening of harsh speech karma. Am I continuing to create harsh speech karma? You know, it's an invitation to look at, are you creating more of the same or are you just exhausting old stuff? Yeah. And so exhausting old stuff, not creating any new, excellent, saving time. But sometimes in response to the problematic environment, we respond the same old way with another affliction, planting more seeds for the same. So Tara, like all mantras, protects the mind. And particularly, we're protecting the mind from the very things that cause outside hassles, dangers, fears. And we're also training our mind to stop doing the causes for those. 
Does that, that premise kind of make sense to you that it, we're not talking about just external or just internal, we're talking about both? Yeah, and that's part of the Tara benefit. There was an interesting story. One of my friends in Australia, he um, he was around during the bushfires that were right before the pandemic, that the pandemic sort of eclipsed their importance, but they were rather horrible bushfires in Australia right before the pandemic. And his house was under threat. And he decided to do the stay and defend, you know, where you stay on your property and you, you know, are ready with the hoses and all of the things and you're going to put out the fire if it comes to your house. And he was kind of semi rural. And it was coming, it was coming, it was coming. And literally a big fireball kind of came out of the forest towards him. And he he was like, oh crap, here we go. Like, you know, it's like, it's jumped the road, it's coming. And he started reciting Tara mantra and it split and went around his house. Now I was not there. He may have been exaggerating, but I mean, all around him was burnt and his house was okay. So I'm like, well, Tara, <laughs> right? Amazing. Right. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing to sit with of if we've created the cause for it, saying the mantra can activate our protection karma if we've created protection karma in the past. And probably we've all been kind, sweet parents protecting our children in this or past lives. We've been good, kind pet parents and taken care of our pets well and protected them from dangers. Like we do have lots of protection karma, no doubt. We're nice people. How can we water it and activate it? A powerful condition is a mantra like Tara. So these stories can be inspiring, but also, you know, grain of salt, conditions apply. <laughs> so you can do it this way where you're saying the mantra, or you can do something like this prayer from the first Dalai Lama. And you can kind of say, okay, driven by the wind of inappropriate attention, billowing forth swirling smoke clouds of misconduct. It has the power to burn down forests of goodness, the fire of anger, please protect us from this danger. And you imagine sort of praying to Tara, this prayer, and then you sit and you just om tare tu tare ture soha and imagine green nectar light coming, planting the seeds for that kind of protection, as well as purifying past causes of having done so. And then we have the fear or the danger of water, like floods, and the fear of attachment. So there's the Tara who saves from the fear of the danger of water and the fear of attachment. Attachment is like water. Some dirt on dry cloth can be brushed off easily. But when the cloth is wet, the dirt soaks right into it, and it becomes incredibly difficult to clean. The wet cloth and the dirt sort of become inseparable. In the same way, it is almost impossible to separate the attached mind from the object of attachment. This Tara can protect us from all the outside dangers caused through water, such as floods and tsunamis, as well as the danger of attachment. So, you know, really think practically about attachments in your life, you know, whether it's food or an activity or a person or whatever, especially if it's like gotten into like obsession category and it's really problematic. If you can't stop thinking about it, whatever it is, try saying the mantra as a circuit breaker and also to kind of help settle the mind and come back to your good kind heart. Sometimes analysis is not going to work if you have a really inflamed attachment. Sometimes you just need to interrupt the momentum of it. Yeah. So you do this with attachment or with anything, but it's helpful to know that's one of the benefits of Tara Mantra. So you think sweeping us in the torrent of cyclic existence so hard to cross. We're conditioned by the propelling winds of karma. We are tossed in the waves of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The flood of attachment. Please protect us from this fear. Om Tari Tutari Tari Soha. And then we have the fear or danger of lions and the fear of pride. So probably lions, less of a danger for us where we live, but you never know. Um, but pride, certainly. So there is the Tara who saves from the fear of the danger of lions and of pride. The, so the snow lion exemplifies pride because it lives in very high places and thinks of itself the most powerful and magnificent of all the animals. 
and regular lions as well. There's this kind of um, Tibetan Buddhist iconography about lions having floppy ears that gets repeated in like our monastic clothes. For example, we have these little flappies on the end of our ceremonial robes, and it's to represent lion ears flop down because if you have confidence in dharma you're like a king of practitioners and you don't have to be alert the way a lion doesn't have to be alert because it doesn't have any predators you know so it gives you this confidence and this bravery but the flip side is if you're not careful it can turn into pride so we have all of these little flappy things like reminding us of keep confidence dispel pride you know hold your vows well but don't get cocky you know these kind of little um, mind training methods that are peppered through our clothes. Yes. Um, and yes, of course, mountain lions, Karen's pointing out. Yes, a fair amount of mountain lions in California. Yes, it's not just regular um, African lions. We do have mountain lions, right? Yeah, probably just there, <laughs> right? There's so many deer. Okay. Um, tari, tu tari, so, um, tari, tu tari, so, um, so, um, so, dwelling on the mountains of wrong views of selfhood, puffed up with holding itself superior it claws other beings with contempt the lion of pride please protect us from this danger and then we've got fear or danger of elephants and the elephant is used as an example of ignorance because when it's in untamed its harm can be enormous so i think this one can be confusing because elephants are so smart right Elephants are so smart, but we're not talking about the fact that they're smart. We're talking about when they really go off, you know, when there's a rampaging elephant, it just destroys everything. And sometimes we minimize the danger of our ignorance, but because of ignorance, so much else gets worse. So we think not tamed by the sharp hooks of mindfulness and vigilance dulled by the maddening liquor of sensual pleasures it enters wrong paths and shows its harmful tusks the elephant of ignorance please protect us from this danger om tari tu tari tari so and then the next tara is the one who saves from the fear of the danger of hungry ghosts of doubt sometimes called the carnivorous demon of doubt so this is translated as spirits, meaning flesh-eating spirits. So just as they can consume us, so can doubt, making it impossible to make correct virtuous choices. So it's not about that positive doubt of like, I wonder if, or I wonder how, like there's so much good doubt on the spiritual path that's so necessary for wisdom. What we're talking about is when you let doubt eat at you, and you just can't let it go or give it space, you're like nurturing the doubt, rather than kind of saying, what more information do I need to decide yes or no? Yeah, when you can't decide yes or no, that's kind. that kind of doubt makes it impossible to make correct virtuous choices, because you're just paralyzed with indecision. So roaming in the space of darkest confusion, tormenting those who strive for ultimate aims. It is viciously lethal to liberation. The carnivorous demon of doubt, please protect us from this danger. And then the danger of imprisonment and the fear of miserliness. Miserliness ties us to the object, making us cling to it. Further, it ties us to the whole of samsara through desire for samsaric perfections we're attached to. Like a chain that imprisons us, which each link holds the next, our miserliness is always grasping at one object of desire after another. So it's, you know, sometimes we think of attachment and miserliness as like a holding or a hunger, but it's also use, useful to think of it as a binding and a constricting and a tightening. It makes you stuck. So binding embodied beings in the unbearable prison of cyclic existence with no freedom, it locks them in cravings tight embrace. The chain of miserliness, please protect us from this danger. Om Tari Tutari Tari Soha. And then seven is uh, the fear of danger of thieves and of wrong views or heresy. 
Whenever heresy arises through the three rare sublime ones, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, such as denying the teachings on karma and reincarnation, it robs us of the merits that have been collected within our mind stream for countless eons. Because heresy postpones for an incredible length of time the ripening of results of even the merits we have dedicated, it is very dangerous. So this one, I think, warrants a little bit more unpacking. because So heresy um, and wrong views, it's like not just confusion, it's like believing the wrong thing. Yeah, and even, you know, actively criticizing from the wrong perspective, the teachings of the Buddha. So this is not like if you say something bad about the Buddha, the Buddha is going to be mad at you and turn his back or something silly and petty like that. It's not that. And it's not that if you have, um, you know, kind of qualms or like doubts about the Dharma, that that's a bad thing. You should have doubts, like check them out, like have doubts. Some of it's wild, far out stuff, like have a minute and like don't force yourself to believe anything, really sit with it. But the thing about heresy is that if you can think about times in your life unrelated to Dharma, where you've gotten really, really critical about something and really dogmatic in your criticism about something, if you found out that you were wrong, it's kind of like you've built such an identity around what you're saying that you can't even hear new information and change your view, right? We see this happen with politics all the time where you kind of identify with your own criticism. So then nothing can touch you even when you come across different facts that should change your mind, they don't. You get like a confirmation bias. So this kind of heresy and wrong views is when you've kind of decided the wrong thing and you're not going to hear any more about it. You shut your ears down. And if you shut your ears down to the Dharma in this way, it's kind of like even if you start to open back up again, there's part of you that is kind of broken something and it's hard to patch it back up. So Rimsha is, of course, not wrong in the huge dangers of heresy, but the way we hear that sometimes sounds like you're not allowed to question and doubt, when in fact you should question and you should doubt. It's, a, it's about coming to a conclusion that says, well, that is rubbish, nonsense, BS, and I'm flicking it off, it's stupid, I'm better and more than that or something, like getting really your pride involved and really getting a lot of like, yeah, the best example is like in politics, you see it happen all the time where people are so used to believing one certain way that even when they find out new information, it doesn't change their mind because they're so identified with their view. Yeah. And I mean, that can happen to any of us. Yeah. It can happen to any of us. So one of the ways to kind of break through that is to make sure that you keep checking yourself like with some sort of objectivity and detachment, like every once in a while, look at your own life and your beliefs as if from the outside you know, is it healthy? Is it serving the greater good? Like, you know, be critical from that perspective. What, what do you guys think about that one? Is it sitting okay? Or is it kind of um, triggering any questions? Or additions? I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> and usually I look in, on my phone of that yeah. when I don't know. But heresy is the ignorance like to take the um, what is not real for real, right? Um, is it ignorance? Heresy, I don't know. My phone is over there. <laughs> Sorry. Heresy is, is like a belief or a theory that sort of, I guess, goes against teachings. Yeah, you're going against. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I knew that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so thank you. You're believing wrongly. Yeah. Like yeah. you you believe that karma doesn't exist or exactly. inherently exist that is true. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, like colloquially, it's like an opinion that's at odds with what everyone else accepts. Like if you're saying, you know, the sky is yellow or something, you know, you're like, that's mm -hmm. heresy. But we usually frame mm -hmm. it that way. It's not like it's not like a colloquial term. Right. But with the with the Dharma, it's not like you need to accept every single tiny nuance of every single commentary in the Dharma. It's that the core things in the Dharma, like positive actions lead to happiness, negative actions lead to suffering. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, I reinforce and strengthen my ethics. Um, if you suddenly think, 
no, nah, that's not true, <laughs> right? I can hurt people and still be happy. Yeah, and you start kind of saying, yeah, look, I hurt someone the other day and I felt great about it. You know, karma didn't get me and I've gotten away with it. Oh, actually that shows karma's nonsense. And you go down a whole kind of really um, short-sighted rabbit hole and leave behind your ethics. That's heresy. Yeah. But it's not challenging it and going, okay, well, what is good and what is negative? And what is happiness and what is suffering and why does that play out that way? And, you know, asking deep questions is really important, but it's, if you start going, actually, now that's complete rubbish. One of the core tenets that are going to block your progress. It's a religious term, right? It's a a religious, uh, yeah, I, I, I I'm sure it's used in other contexts occasionally, but almost never. It's pretty much all religious Mm -hmm. context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use it in joke sometimes, right? Like, like if someone says, I don't even like Beyonce, you're like, oh, heresy, <laughs> right? You don't like Beyonce, <laughs> heresy, right? But yeah, normally religious context. Look, it's it's one of these things where we don't want to get heavy about it. It's It's about being a little bit careful that in our very useful sort of playing with ideas, side of ourselves that we don't get into the trap of really neglecting that the core values that we've adopted and we've taken on board we believe they're useful and we actually don't need to challenge them anymore once we're kind of all in buddhist but all of the details and the nuances might be up for grabs for years and years to come and need a huge amount of kind of wrestling with but we don't want to be kind of adopting a position that is so counter to the path that we can't progress yeah and you know and and it can happen right this is this happens with a lot of people with uh crisis right when there's a big crisis and somehow your faith isn't holding you you start to doubt your faith rather than doubting your engagement of it or your integration of it or your understanding of it you think the faith itself is the problem or you yourself are the problem. So either you're a lost cause or it's a load of crap when neither is true, right? You're not a lost cause. It's not a load of crap. You're going through a rough moment and you didn't have as many tools as you thought you did, but it's okay. You'll get through it. You know, you'll find them, you'll integrate them. But in those really, you know, fragile moments, it is easy to say to yourself, that's a load of crap. It didn't work because it's a hard moment, right? And you know, you had an intellectual understanding, but it hadn't deepened yet. Yeah, so gently, but you know, that one is, is a tricky one. So then the prayer for it is roaming the fearful wilds of inferior practice and the barren wastes of absolutism and nihilism, those being the worst wrong views, right? Absolutism, nihilism. They sack the towns and hermitages of benefit and bliss the thieves of wrong views, please protect us from this danger. And then the last one is the danger of snakes and the fear of jealousy. And just as a snake can creep up on us unobserved and bite us, jealousy can bite us and cause us such pain. So the prayer is lurking in its dark pit of ignorance, unable to bear the wealth and excellence of others it swiftly injects them with its cruel poison. The snake of jealousy, please protect us from this danger. Om tare tu tare ture soha. So those are the eight fears um, that tu tare protects from. And then ture releases from disease. So this is related to true cessation and true path. And soha is so be it, may these ideas take root and integrate. So you can read the rest of those slides some other time, but um, for more on Tara, I really suggest this one with the arrows, How to Free Your Mind by Tupton Children. It's a really, really excellent book. And these other ones are great as well. So we'll have like a two minute stretch and then we'll do a short meditation. So just two minutes. So we'll do the meditation and then on Thursday we'll start with the meditation and do it in its slightly longer form and um, 
talk a bit more about the practice. So if you want to just get yourself settled and um, definitely if you're having questions arise, um, save them so we can talk about them on Thursday for sure. <clears throat> okay, nice straight back. Settling into your space in a more meditative way. So making sure that there's tension releasing, back straightening. Just bringing your awareness to the body. And refuge in bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Yadam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamni And so visualize Tara in the space in front. And first think of all the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and emptiness of all the Buddhas, which fully sees all existence. This is the holy mind of the Dharmakaya, the absolute guru. Just as sentient beings act under the control of anger and attachment, Buddhas work for all living beings under the control of compassion. At this time, the holy mind of all the Buddhas, the absolute guru, manifests in this particular form of Tara. With one face and two arms, she is in the aspect of a very beautiful 16-year-old girl. Her face is very beautiful with a spite smile. Her eyes are not open widely, but are fine and a little rounded, very loving and compassionate. When we look at Tara, her eyes express compassion toward us, that like the look of a loving mother gives her only child. Her hair is very dark, half down and half tied up. The center of her hair has an Utpala flower as a crown. A tiara fastened in her hair is adorned with jewels, the central one being a ruby, symbolizing Amitabha, the principal Buddha of her Buddha family, the Padma or Lotus family. Her right hand rests on her right knee, palm outward, in the mudra of granting sublime realizations, indicating her ability to provide beings with whatever they desire. Her left hand at her heart holds the stem of an Utpala flower with her thumb and ring finger together symbolizing the unification of method and wisdom. 
and the other three fingers raised, symbolizing Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Her right leg is extended, showing she was always ready to rise up and come to the aid of those who need her, while her left leg is drawn up, showing her renunciation of worldly desires. She has a moon disc behind her. She is adorned with the complete holy signs and exemplifications of a Buddha. On her forehead is a white om, the essence of the holy Vajra body. At her neck, red al, the essence of the Vajra holy mind. At her throat, a blue hum, the essence of the Vajra holy mind. And so stabilize Tara in the space in front, or just a general impression of radiant green light. From the ohm at Tara's forehead, white nectar beams are emitted and enter you through your forehead, completely purifying all the obscurations and negative karmas you've accumulated with the body from beginningless rebirths until now. From the ah at Tara's throat, red nectar beams are emitted and enter through your throat completely purifying all the obscurations and negative karmas accumulated with your speech from beginningless rebirths until now. From the whom at Tara's heart, blue nectar beams are emitted and enter your heart completely purifying all the obscurations and negative karmas accumulated with your mind from beginningless rebirths until now. Out of compassion for you and all living beings, Mother Tara has purified you. And so stabilize the visualization. White light to the forehead red light to the throat, blue light to the heart center. From her to you, purifying body, speech, and mind. And then add the mantra. Om Tare to Tare to Re Soha. 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 Om Tare. To Tare to Re Soha, Om Tare, to Tare to Re Soha, Om Tare, to Tare to Re Soha. 
and continue the mantra under your breath together with the visualization. Om um, Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha. And think without a delay of even a second, may I become Tara. And in each second, free uncountable numbers of living beings from all their sufferings and lead them to full enlightenment. Because rather than following the selfish mind, you are using your life to serve others because of your attitude of bodhicitta, Tara is extremely pleased. She melts into green light, enters through your forehead, and absorbs into you. And think my body, speech, and mind have become Tara's vajra body, vajra speech, and vajra mind. Or if you don't have the empowerment, just blessings planting the seed to actually achieve Tara. And we dedicate. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And remember the emptiness of the three spheres, agent, action, and object lack inherent existence because they dependently arise. Okay, you can relax your attention. So um, this evening, if you want an experimental homework, um, there's a common tradition that you fall asleep imagining that you sleep in Tara's lap and that uh, she helps you during your dream state to be lucid and stay along the path to enlightenment. So if that feels like a comforting or interesting practice, you can experiment with that tonight as you go to bed. Imagine you fall asleep in Tara's lap and she's sort of continuously sending blessings all throughout your sleep. So um, should you choose to accept it, I'll see you um, Thursday. Thanks, guys. <laughs>